Hello and welcome to Trauma in Schools. This is the second video that accompanies reporting and responding to child abuse. In this training video, we will learn about adverse childhood events and explore the definition of trauma. We'll explore the impact of trauma on children's behavior, as well as how trauma impacts the brain and how it is likely to man manifest and impact student learning. We will look at traditional versus trauma-informed practice and we'll end the online training with um, the opportunity to explore the benefits of trauma-informed practice within your school setting. Let's begin with this brief video on adverse childhood events. This video is really critical um, as it was a pivotal piece of research that really um, is credited with the way that trauma is at the forefront of, of so, so many of our systems today. In this video, we're going to learn about the significance of adverse childhood events. We're going to learn about trauma and we're going to learn about the multifaceted impact of trauma on the body. Um, and you can be thinking about this in context of the students you'll be teaching, as well as um, people in their lives. What does your parents' divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development as well as the immune system increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle-class and college-educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, 
the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. So some of the takeaways from that film, some things that may have surprised any of you who haven't um, seen uh, any videos or been to any training on trauma is the, um, the impact beyond uh, making us feel bad. Um, pretty startling to see the, the way that trauma can manifest in the body um, and that the more ACEs one has, the higher the impact all the way up to the potential of, of dying 20 years younger. Um, so we, we know that trauma has actually changed the face of practice, both in the medical field, schools, in social services, community health centers. And so it's great that you're starting off your profession as the future teachers of our state, um, really being mindful about this. I can tell you as a practitioner for over 30 years that um, this was not at the forefront of the practice when I started out. Um, and I, I look back sometimes with um, significant regret um, at uh, the missed opportunities. When we think about adverse childhood experiences and we think about the different things that the students that you're likely to be encountering in your classrooms, um, may experience at home and how that's going to potentially impact their ability to be fully present, um, to engage in learning, to interact without difficulty with peers. You start to, to recognize that homeschool connection becomes that much more important. Now, understanding where kids are coming from um, as a, a way to give you pause, not to pathologize kids' behaviors, but to give you an opportunity to consider where um, behaviors might be coming from. So we have these different traumatic experiences, but I'd also like you um, to, to think about some of the, the other places where children experience poverty, um, racial oppression, other factors that can set them up for adversity. Um, and, and they end up becoming factors that are stacked. Um, they experience difficulty in their communities, that filters into the school, there's difficulty at home. And so we wanna be really inclusive as we're considering where children may be experiencing difficulty. When we think about the impact of trauma, um, certainly it's not limited to childhood or adolescence, but this visual right here from Bartlett and Staber from 2019 really gives us a sense of the pervasive impact that trauma has across the life experience of a child. We see it impacting their cognition, their physical health, emotions, relationships, mental health, behavior, and brain development. And in a little bit, we'll watch a video that really helps us understand how trauma really does impact and change 
brain functioning. This image here is a nice opportunity for us to pause and to think about the different ways that you will be interacting with children um, and how these different domains of impact, um, you know, give you an opportunity to potentially observe um, needs in a child, provide intervention and support, but also to really help to adjust your teaching to be inclusive and mindful of the way that trauma is likely to impact children in your class. When we think about responding to trauma, as I said a few minutes ago, as a young practitioner, um, fresh out of college, I didn't have the luxury of, of a trauma-informed approach. We certainly were mindful that maltreatment impacted children and different adversity impacted them, um, but the approach to it really wasn't stepping back and trying to deconstruct where the behavior was coming from. Behaviors were viewed as problems that needed to be fixed, um, and sometimes those problems resulted in people looking at children and adults um, as having bad behavior or not being good people. You're really entering your practice at a critical time where we can look at things more holistically. <clears throat> the slides that follow will give you an opportunity just to consider the traditional paradigm versus what we're really fortunate to be practicing with today. This cartoon um, gives us an opportunity to think about all of those things that children and adolescents bring to school with them each and every day. They don't have the benefit of coming into school and starting fresh. They bring all of the wonderful things that might be happening in their home and in their community, as well as um, some of the hardship. And here you see this youngster going into school, passing the lockers with um, uh, all kinds of luggage. One says homelessness, hunger, sickness, and, um, and the student says, could someone help me with these? I'm late for math class, right? And so um, kids for the most part don't always have the agency to stop and say, can you help me with these? Um, they're sometimes unable to talk about it. For some kids, the, the trauma they've experienced can become so normalized that they don't even realize that, that it is. It was a traumatic experience. I've seen that with men that I've worked with in the prison system. When they recount their life stories, there's not even any acknowledgement of the extreme trauma that they've been exposed to throughout their entire lives. So it's up to us as the adults in the scenario to really be mindful about what we're seeing. The likelihood that you are going to uh, encounter children who have been affected by trauma um, as you enter your student teaching is very, very high. We know from um, the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, um, their data suggests that nearly 35 million children in the U.S. have experienced at least one type of childhood trauma. In addition to this statistic, you have the, the um, ACES study as well that we just watched a video on. We know that one out of every four children attending school have been exposed to a traumatic event that can affect their behavior. Here's that reinforcement that nothing, there's no dividing line between what happens outside of school and school, everything intermingles. And lastly, Chronic exposure to traumatic events, especially during a child's early years, can have significant, significant um, impacts. One, it can adversely affect attention, memory, and cognition. Um, you see uh, the impact that it has on the developing brain. Um, it can reduce a child's ability to focus, organize, and process information, those executive functioning skills. It can interfere with effective problem solving and or planning, um, and it can result in overwhelming feelings of frustration and anxiety. So kids who have difficulty self-regulating, um, you may be seeing a byproduct of trauma. When we think about the traditional lens, um, we, we tend to um, have kind of been taught things in boxes, you know, neat little 
um, organized boxes that children in these age groups behave this way, and if they're not, then there's something wrong. Um, and so um, we, we have to really challenge these traditional lenses. Um, when we think about um, some of the difficult behaviors that children might manifest, um, we see um, unpredictability, sudden changes or transitions, loss of control, sensory overload, rejection, confrontation, intimacy, um, uh, and, and even praise and positive attention. We see different behaviors that could really trigger difficulties for children. So teachers are then left to associate behaviors with, um, you know, is this child just not listening? Are they being bad? Um, as opposed to really thinking about these behavioral manifestations as a, as a manifestation of trauma. Um, in the past, uh, there's been a focus on using behavior management techniques, talking to kids, um, giving them warnings, um, you know, trying to use these very prescriptive approaches when in fact um, the underlying factor could be trauma. And, and these approaches tend to escalate a child's traumatic responses because they don't have their brain is literally in a protective mode and it does not have the ability to respond in this logical fashion that our traditional models of education have taught us. <clears throat> I'm going to bring these up right here so that we can look at them all together. With a trauma-informed lens, we recognize that problematic student behaviors reflect developmental responses um, to their experiences as opposed to something being wrong with the child or the child being bad. Um, when we use a trauma-informed lens, we can help teachers identify what might be motivating students to react. Um, and we can also use that same information to help come up with alternatives that um, can help them prepare for triggers and also learn how to manage stress. And overall, this approach helps teachers to be better able to understand children's reactions and responses, um, which can help kids feel safer. It demonstrates empathy for them. Um, and it also really gives them access to some coping strategies that can promote resilience and healing down the road. The trauma-informed approach is um, a very, um, very uh, intense approach and um, uh, you can find trainings that go on for, you know, semesters on it. Um, I want to give you just a quick crash course because I know that not all of the schools that you're going to be in uh, may be operating fully under a trauma-informed approach. You might find some colleagues there who are doing it. Um, I would encourage you that you can bring these skills and, and this perspective with you into any setting that you go. It's great if an entire system has been transformed through a trauma-informed approach, but um, it's enough for you to start with you and for you to be the point going forward that can make the difference. So when we think about the four R's in the trauma approach, we talk about realization. Um, and that's acknowledging the presence and widespread impact of trauma um, across our society. And the fact that it, it has, it's not just about someone's feelings being hurt. Um, as you saw in the ACEs study, it really does speak to this very pervasive whole body um, impact. The ability to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma, difficulty with self-regulation, um, noticing patterns when um, behaviors manifest or erupt and starting to, to realize that there's some triggering going on. Um, the ability to respond in a way that embraces trauma understanding. So again, instead of blaming a child or labeling a behavior bad, really stepping back and not thinking, what is wrong with that child, but thinking, hmm, what might have happened to that child that could be contributing to these behaviors? It not only is a benefit for the child, but it also is a benefit for us because it takes us down a notch and allows us to consider a whole other realm of possibility. And lastly, resist practices that could inadvertently re-traumatize. Um, 
And when we look at some of the traditional approaches, um, although there was no ill intent, um, the ways that we used to respond um, using, using kind of um, punishment, um, blame, uh, really exacerbated the situation. So we really want to put to work realization, recognition, response, and resistance um, so that we can help to make a difference in the lives of the students that we're going to be teaching. When we look at the key principles that are aligned with the trauma-informed approach, we can really start to get a sense of the community that's built, being built, the relationships that are being built. And, and just the um, connection beyond the school to a broader context. So we're striving for physical and psychological safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, and cultural, historical and gender issues. So again, it's bigger than the school and we're really opening ourselves up to that possibility. So what can we do to prepare for trauma in schools? Because I promise you, you will encounter it um, and you get to choose how you're going to respond to it. So what does it look like? We have issues of um, fight, flight, or freeze in the classroom. This slide gives you um, an opportunity to consider what the different behaviors might look like. When we talk about flight, it's when kids are having difficulty being present and engaging. And so we might see them being um, withdrawn or isolating. They may try to get out of the classroom or just leave. They may bunk school. Um, they may kind of stim off and, and not be able to attend in the class. Um, they might uh, avoid interactions with their peers. Um, you know, and overall just really being disengaged, unable to be with you in that moment. When we think about the fight, um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's when kids' response to trauma is to act out. With flight, we see kids acting inward with themselves, taking themselves to, you know, a different place, removing themselves either physically or psychologically. With fight, we see kids responding to the environments and people around them with acting out behavior that can be manifested with aggression, um, disruption with silly behavior, being defiant, being unable to self-regulate, being hyperactive, um, arguing with other students, and even bullying. The last potential option um, is to freeze. And that's when um, a child or adolescent becomes immobilized um, and really does not have that ability to answer, um, doesn't know how to ask for help or to get their needs met, and they keep doing the same behaviors over and over. And I don't, I don't want to, um, you know, suggests that that's not difficult for the teachers because it really is. And it's also difficult for their classmates. Um, giving a blank look as though they have no idea what it is that you're talking about and overall just not being able to respond to the situation at hand. And this lets us know that it's not just about the child's feelings, but that's about something else that's going on. It's about how their brain um, is, is interacting. And so I'd like to use this video, Learning Brain versus Survival Brain by Dr. Jacob Hamm, who's a clinical psychologist who does a lot of work with trauma. And he's really put together, um, you know, a very succinct video that helps us understand what we're dealing with when children have traumatic experiences that they're bringing to the classroom. Hey, welcome back. Today, I really wanted to think about what's the best way to teach teachers about trauma without getting them distracted with all the technical stuff and what's the most important thing for them to understand and learn. And I thought that the best way to do it might be to just make a difference between a learning brain versus a brain in survival mode. So we'll just call it learning brain versus survival brain. And this is the difference. So learning brain is this brain that's open to learning new information and it's completely okay with ambiguity and grays and vagueness and it 
sees the big picture. It like pulls back and is on the balcony, can look over the forest and figure out what's going on. On an emotional level, people in learning brain feel calm, peaceful, maybe a little excited about what they're about to learn, maybe a little playful and having fun too, and definitely curious. And they're not afraid of making mistakes because it's just part of the learning process. And so they're not really thinking about themselves. And they actually feel a little bit of confidence that if they just apply themselves, they might pick up what they're trying to learn. Now, survival brain, on the other hand, is completely different. It's hyper-focused on threat. It doesn't like ambiguity. It wants clear, hard facts. It thinks in black and white terms. It doesn't want anything to be gray at all. And then emotionally, you can imagine that survival brain makes people feel panicky, feel like a little obsessive and afraid of getting things wrong. And they don't feel calm and open to learning new things. They just want to get things over with. And people in survival brain also really don't like making mistakes. And they are afraid of looking stupid too. So students in survival brain don't want to be picked on. They don't want to raise their hand and ask questions and look stupid. And so these people are also filled with doubt about their own ability to learn and stuff. And they're afraid that other people can see how stupid they really are. Now it's really important to understand how learning brain and survival brain interact because survival brain always trumps learning brain. And it makes sense because survival brain is just trying to save your life. And so if it thinks that there's something dangerous happening, you better pay attention to it, right? But the tricky thing is that as survival brain stays on longer and longer, it's harder to get out of that. And it's harder to really go into the learning brain. And the way I think about it is kind of like the myth of Sisyphus. You know that guy who has to push a rock up a hill and then every day it falls back down and he has to do it over and over again? Well, being in learning brain is like being up on the high parts of that mountain. You can see the expanse of what's going on, but it also takes a lot of work to be up there. And at any second, if you're not paying attention and make, putting effort into it, it's so easy to slip back into survival brain again. And that rock that Sisyphus is trying to push up, well, that's kind of like stress. And the more stressed you feel, the heavier and bigger that rock gets, and it just pushes you back into survival brain quicker. Now the kicker is that for traumatized people, stress is a really rigid and intense thing. And so with trauma, any little stress makes that rock grow way bigger than it normally would. And because people with trauma misperceive ambiguous situations as threatening and stressful, that rock just stays big all the time. Now the good news is that the more you control stress, well the easier it is to be in learning brain, right? Because that rock is a lot smaller. And what I really want to highlight for teachers is that the best way to keep students in learning brain goes back to why I spent so much time talking about attachment. Students best learn when they feel like they're safe and supported by the adults around them. So it's kind of like a baby elephant. You know how like on those nature shows, the baby elephant is like playing with leaves or exploring a tree or something like that and having a lot of fun. And the only reason why they can do that is because there's a whole group of mama elephants around that baby, protecting it and looking out for danger. So a kid with trauma or who's stuck in survival brain, it's kind of like that baby elephant who doesn't have protective adults around them. They can't play and learn because they're way too focused looking out for threat and danger. So this is why I really believe that the most important thing that schools need to focus on, way more important than any kind of techniques or curricula, is really whether or not they are creating that environment where students feel like they're surrounded by these big mama elephants who are gonna protect them and watch out for them and make them safe. And when students have that, I bet you it unlocks their curiosity, their eagerness to learn and play as a way to learn. So I hope that's helpful. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Thanks. So just uh, something to think about, right? Um, although the analogy, I would I, I would add that um, that male elephants, uh, you know, father type elephants would also um, be able to exert that same type of calm. So for the male teachers who are watching this, um, you're just as important. Um, it's really about that critical relationship, but it gives you a little bit of a context to consider um, what children's behavior might be the result of and, and how we might be able to intervene.
Okay, so so now let's let's think a little bit um, here as we're coming to the end of this training video. Um, what are you going to do? Um, what can you do? It's an inevitability that you will be confronting children who have had um, or are in the midst of traumatic experiences. So the first thing that we can do is to really, as educators, um, know ourselves, be in charge of our own regulation, and know what our triggers are. Right, um, you know, even those of you who might be working with really little kids, um, things can happen that can push your buttons. We all come with our own historical self and in our own experiences, some of which can also include trauma. And so we wanna make sure that we are really self-aware as we enter the classroom um, and that we know what happens um, when we get triggered by different things. Does it cause fatigue? Um, is it reminiscent of previous bad experiences? Um, does it challenge our belief system? Um, this goes back to uh, what I had shared earlier about um, labeling behavior as bad or people as not being good people um, because of different differences. Um, in, in the first video, I talked about the need for that cultural context, right? And so really needing to know exactly where you're standing so it's important to stop, take a deep breath before we intervene with children, um, before we kind of get on that impulse so that we know that we're coming from the, hmm, I wonder what might have happened to this child, right? Um, and it allows us to be really centered in our thoughts and our emotions so that we can be intentional instead of reactionary. When we get to know our students, um, we'll start to be able to determine things that might trigger students, in which case we can become a partner with them in staving off um, the meltdowns um, and providing ways to help model and engage in good regulatory behaviors with children. We can recognize when the behavior is about control and try to avoid those power struggles and, and think about ways that we can help children feel more in control of their lives. We can communicate to students that you have faith in their ability to grow and succeed and be a partner with them in, in planning, um, you know, very incrementally to make that happen. It's critical in your role to be able to provide consistency, positivity, and integrity as you interact with, with students. One of the things that I've learned over my career is that for some students, um, school teachers may be the most consistent adults in their lives. Um, and school teachers are, are adults who um, have, have played transformative roles in our lives that you know, even when we're grown and becoming professionals ourselves, that we still remember those teachers. We remember the teachers who made a difference. And we also remember the teachers that um, could have and should have done a better job. If we look at behaviors that are being manifested as um, needs, as evidence of something that children don't have that they're trying to get, it helps us counteract any impulse to see them as defiance-based. Um, we have the opportunity to think outside of the box, unlike the way uh, my professional career started with a very either or type of a mindset. Right, and so we can see what the different needs that children present with are and how we might change our teaching or engage them in different ways that really help um, support them and maybe um, help them overcome some of the things that might trigger their trauma in the classroom. Um, and it's an opportunity not to, not to have this sympathy for children, certainly empathy, um, because these children aren't damaged. Um, they've had a negative experience and they're retraining their bodies and their brains and their hearts and their minds to expect different things. You can be a part of that different expectation that they start to, to build. And so you really wanna focus on the strengths and potential that children have regardless of their background. And I would say that the same is also true of the families that they come from. We want to avoid labeling um, and talk about the behavior and not a name for it 
I, you know, talk about, you know, it is really difficult when you start screaming in the classroom or when you've hit your, your fellow students because you make them feel sad. Um, really define it in terms of the behaviors. Um, be concrete in offering suggestions for how children can manage their emotions. And then also be really mindful of the classroom activities that you're going to be developing and engaging in so that they promote that sense of community. Um, I, I can't tell you how many well-intentioned teachers that I've worked with um, have really exacerbated things for children. Um, for example, um, uh, when I've observed a number of classrooms where um, activities during different holidays, Father's Day, Mother's Day, or, um, you know, bring a baby picture in and um, inevitably sitting in those classes um, when there have been foster children um, who don't have access to their parents, who many of whom don't have access to um, anything more than what they took with them when they were removed from their home. And so things like that can be a real trigger. So just trying to be really culturally aware and, um, and really know your students and be inclusive. Um, I want to end just with some comments of um, educators who went to a symposium on trauma-sensitive schools. Um, because I realize, again, that not everybody is going to go into a school uh, or a school district, for that matter, that is able to fully be trauma-sensitive and trauma-informed. Um, however, there's no reason that we can't be that agent of change, that in the interactions that you're responsible for, that you can't bring some of this mindset. Um, and who knows, maybe your presence in a school that isn't quite here yet might be the thing that starts to turn the dial for them and make a difference for the students, not only that you'll be student teaching this year, but the ones who'll come after you. So I'd like to share this video with you. And that's what we want to talk about today. Um, are we acting uh, on the best information we have? Um, so one of the big things that brought me to this event was just learning, becoming more trauma informed. Uh, a lot of our students come from uh, backgrounds where they've experienced trauma. And I think it's our job as educators to be able to educate them in the best way possible. And I think that comes from uh, learning how to um, inform our own practices about trauma. Well, another teacher kind of inspired me to do more learning on um, trauma informed practices in the classroom and creating a nurturing climate in order to support students. Um, and so because of her, I found her on Instagram and she kind of just influenced me to, to get more involved and do more readings. The ACEs are, is a really great frame, but we don't take into consideration other traumas. Bullying in school, that's trauma. Racism, that's trauma. All of the different things that we see that we, you know, the ACEs is compartmentalizing, saying these are the big 10 T's. Right? But there's so much more. And this brings us to the end of our video. I'd just like to leave you with, um, with just one, one other tip. As an educator, you're going to be spending an awful lot of time taking care of the students in your classroom. Um, maybe even reaching out to their families and um, providing information and, and even potentially connections um, that support the well-being of that student and their family. Don't forget yourself um, in that caretaking process because um, the difficult situations that you engage in with students who come to school with different traumas, they impact you. There's vicarious traumatization when day in, day out, we're dealing with um, children who are coming from difficult backgrounds and whose pain is really evident in our classroom. That can be further exacerbated when we're in schools that are affected by poverty, you don't have the resources that you need, um, 
you know, and, and you're feeling like you're in that uphill battle, kind of what Dr. Ham was talking to us about. And so I just want to encourage you as you're spending all of this time preparing to become um, a teacher um, so that you can really make a difference for the students and the schools and the families that you're going to be interacting with. I want you to make sure that you put yourself on that list of, of taking care of and, and reflecting on the needs of. Um, and with that, I, I hope you all have a wonderful school year, whether it's in person or virtual or a combination. Um, please know that you make a tremendous difference in the lives of children and adolescents. And um, I wish you a wonderful year and a very successful career. Thank you so much.